Hey guys, my name is Frank, and this is the Poth on Programming video log part 5 of how to make a tile based platforming game in pure HTML5 and JavaScript. Today, I'm going to show you how I added sprite animation to the game so you can take my example and use it to put sprite animation into your own programs. So stay tuned to find out how it's done. In this video, I'm going to talk about what's new in part 5. Then I'll give you a very simple and brief refresher on how sprite animation works when using a sprite sheet, and finally we'll take an in-depth look at the animator class and how it works with the player's movement to render the appropriate animations. If you learned something, give this video a like, and if you have any questions or comments, of course those go in the comments section. Now let's get to the video. Alrighty, so the first thing I want to take a look at in part 5 is the example program, and as you can see in this example program, I no longer am working with the little white and gray square, now I am working with this animated rabbit, and he looks a lot better. It's starting to look a lot more like a game that you can actually play, just minus power-ups and items and stuff like that. So basically not much has changed other than I've added an animator class that does the sprite animation, and I've also tweaked his physics for jumping and stuff like that a little bit, but that's pretty pretty common sense stuff kind of know how to do that if you're already to this point in the tutorial series so I'm not gonna worry about the specific changes I made for this video instead I'm just gonna worry about showing you guys how the animator class works to get this guy animated on the screen if you do want to see what has actually changed in the code since part 4 take a look at the source code that I've linked in the video description at the top of each file that has changed and for part 5 it's just these three the game the display and the main files for each file that has changes in it, I've added a bulleted list in the comments at the top of each file that outlines what exactly has changed specifically in the code. So if you want to find out what's changed, take a look at the source code and take a look at these comments. But in this video, I'm just going to focus on the animator class and how to get this dude animated on the screen. So stay tuned and I'll show you how it's done. Now let's take a brief look at how sprite animation actually works when you're using a sprite sheet. So this here is my sprite sheet image, it's a PNG has all my tile graphics in it, has my sprite images in it. Now each sprite animation is just a compilation of these different unique images. So each image can be considered just a square that you would cut out of this bigger image and then put on the screen in quick succession to give yourself an animation. So for instance, right now my player character isn't doing anything, he's just sitting still. This frame is literally being cut from this position right here. If you notice, this and this are exactly the same image. So currently he is displaying this frame of animation. If I were to move him to the left, now he's going to stand still. He's going to be displaying this frame right here. When he's walking, it's going to give me an animation. So I'm going to be playing those frames over and over again in quick succession. It's kind of hard to tell because he's walking so fast, but He's basically playing, when I walk to the right, he's playing this set of frames right here. He's stepping through these four frames right here, and that's going to give me my animation. So what's happening is, on every frame that I draw to the screen, I'm going to see which frame that my player character's class is determining that he should show based on his movement pattern. It's going to take that frame, it's going to go into this tile sheet image, it's going to cut that specific frame out of the tile sheet. It is then going to take that frame and draw it to the player's location on this display canvas, this canvas element that I have in the browser window, and you're going to see whatever frame that is supposed to be dis displayed, and that's going to give you animation. So that's basically how it works. Basically, you're just cutting different images out of a bigger sprite sheet image, and you're displaying those smaller images at the player's unique location on the screen. Now we're going to take an in-depth look at what makes the code actually work, or I guess we're just going to take an in-depth look at the code because the code makes the code work. So here I'm going to start with the frame class. Now the frame class is just going to define a rectangular region that we are going to cut our sprite images out of the tile sheet with. So it has an x value, a y value, a width, and a height, and that's just going to be the source rectangle that defines the individual image inside of our sprite sheet. So I'm going to use one of those frame classes to define each rectangular region for each one of these individual images. So that's what the frame class is going to be for and just bear with me as I explain all these different classes and you'll see how they fit together at the end of this part of the video. So don't worry about the offset x and y positions just yet, I'll tell you about those later. Just 
Keep in mind, it's just a rectangular region for the moment. Now we're going to look at the tile set class, and this used to be the tile sheet class inside of the display file, but I moved it over to the game file. Basically, the functionality is exactly the same. I just renamed it, and its location is different. Basically, just keeps track of the number of columns and tile size of our rabbit trap sprite sheet image, and that's it. Where animation comes in here is with the frames array. So now we just talked about the frames class, which is down there. The frames class is just a rectangular region with an offset position. Each one of these values inside of this frames array is just going to be one of the rectangular regions that corresponds to a specific graphic for our animation. So for example, this frame is where the idle left graphic is inside of our sprite sheet. This frame is where the jump left graphic is inside of our sprite sheet. This group of frames is going to be where all of the individual graphics are for the walk left animation. Down here we got the walk right animation. So basically all I'm doing is defining each rectangular region for every one of my sprite animation components, or basically these individual images. So now you know where the individual frames are going to be defined inside of the tile set class. Now we're actually going to have to define what those animations are. So the animation itself is going to be defined by the object that's using it. So the animation for this rabbit or for the player is going to live inside of the player class. So every unique animation, the idle frames, the walking left and right frames, the jump frames, those are all going to be stored inside of the player class inside of its prototype. So I'm just scrolling up to that. Here we have the player prototype and inside of it we have an object called frame sets. And inside of frame sets we have all the different animations for the player. We have his idle left, jump left, move left, and then the rightwards motions for those different animations. So each one of these values corresponds to a frame inside of our tile sets frames array. So for example, idle left is going to have a value of zero in it, and zero is going to be the frame index or the index inside of our frames array where the rectangular region is defined to cut the image out of the sprite sheet for the idle left animation, and that's just going to be here. So this is index zero inside of our frames array. It's idle left, and that's what we're going to use for the idle left animation of our player and that's why that value is going to be a zero. So as you can see, each one of these values just corresponds to a different frame inside of the frames array. And what a frame is, it's just a rectangular region that we use to cut out our sprite sheet images from the sprite sheet. So how do we actually animate these? That's going to be our next class that we look at, and that's going to be the animator class. So I'm going to scroll up to the animator class, and I'm going to take a look at what this guy does. So Here's the animator class. It's a frame rate dependent animation class. So what that means is the rate of frames that you see for each animation is going to be totally dependent on the game engine's frame rate. So if you don't want that kind of functionality, this probably isn't for you. But if you're just going to run your game consistently at 30 frames per second across all devices, this is probably what you want to do. And for HTML5 games, that's a pretty good bet. So this will probably work for you. So I define a couple different values in here. I have count, delay, frame set. Frame set is going to be uh, those different frame sets or those different animation arrays that I define inside the player. So for example, frame set could be, I'm going to scroll down here, it could be any one of these animations. It could be idle left, it could be this array right here, it could be move left, which is that array right there. It could be any one of those and basically, it's just going to use that information and loop through it when it does my animation. So, oh, I think I went too far. Here we go. So the frame set is just going to be one of those arrays with those values. And those values, of course, correspond to our different frames that we use to cut the animation image out of the sprite sheet. Frame index is just going to be where we are or where the playhead is, so to speak, inside of that frame set array. Frame value is going to be the value of whatever index we're in inside of our frame set. So for idle left, remember that was value zero, the value was zero. So for that particular animation, it would be at index zero inside of the frame set and the value would also be zero for the idle left image. 
and then we have mode mode right now for this example there are only two modes we have pause and we have loop now pause and loop are just going to be the two types of playback that we want our animations to do so pretty simply i'm going to just explain that as we go i'm going to come down to the loop function all it does is it just changes the playhead position every so many frames that pass in our game loop so count is going to increase one time on every cycle of our game loop until it reaches the delay that we specify so for the walking left and right animations i've de i've defined a delay of five inside of the player class so every five frames of our game loops animation or cycle we are going to run the code inside of this while loop so count we're just going to decrease that by delay and that makes us wait again frame index this is where we set the frame index or the playhead inside of our animation basically this we're just going to say is the frame index currently less than the frame set dot length so let's take a visual look at what's going on here inside of our rabbit trap png so let's say the frame set that we're going to use has values that correspond to the walking right animation which is going to be these four frames right here so frame index at zero is going to yield a frame value of this image right here at frame index of one i'm going to move over one it's going to be a value that corresponds to this image right here when i move it over again it's going to correspond to this image right here so basically what the code inside of the loop function is doing is it's just increasing my frame index by one until it reaches the end of the frame set and when it reaches the end of the frame set the next time it goes to increase instead it just sets it back to zero so inside of my loop function all that we're going to do is just say set the frame index equal to the frame index plus one if it's not yet past the end of our frame set length and if it is past the end of the frame set length just set it to zero to restart the animation loop over again then finally what we do is we get the frame value that's just going to be the value that corresponds to, to the specific rectangular region that we store in the tile sets frames array that corresponds to the image that we're going to be cutting out of the sprite sheet so the frame value is just going to be set to whatever our frame set array is and we're going to hand in the index of the the playhead so whatever frame index is that's going to give us the value inside of our frame set that we're currently at in the animations loop cycle all right so that was a mouthful and hopefully i'm explaining everything quite well i think the next place we want to go is probably the render function but first i want to just touch on uh this functionality here the change frame set function inside of the animator class and basically what this does is it just changes what frame set we're using so whenever i press left on the keyboard i'm going to call change frame set it's just going to change the frame set to the left animation which is that array inside of the player class that defines which frames to use for the left animation uh, when i press right it's going to call change frame set i'm going to hand in the player's right movement animation if i jump to the left i'm going to call change frame set i'm going to hand in the left animation you kind of get what i'm saying here then the only other function in here it's going to be the animate function it just checks to see which mode we're in loop or pause pause is going to be for no animation so pause is going to be called on the idle animation so idle right and idle left pause is going to be the play method that we use for the walking animations we're going to be using the loop method because we want to keep animating that cycle of frames over and over and over again and basically this is just called on every frame and it just calls the corresponding method it's pretty simple so now that we know how we're animating our frames let's actually take a look at the render function which lives inside of the main file and we're going to take a look at how we actually use that frame information to cut our image out of the sprite sheet itself so the first thing we do we're actually going to have to jump to another section of the code real quick because i'm using an assets manager to load my tile set image so real quick i'm just going to jump up here check out the assets manager class all it is is an image and I'm going to load in an image with our rabbit trap .png image inside of it. So really all that we're doing here is just using the assets manager to load our tile sheet. 
really simple. So that's all that is. Don't worry about it too much. You could write your own code. You don't need an assets manager. All you need is to load up the tile sheet image to use it for drawing from that tile sheet image. So here we go. Here's where we get the frame value. So frame, we're going to get the, the frame, remember, is just that rectangular region, but we're going to get to it through all those classes I just talked about. So the animation class is going to give us a pointer to a frame value, which lives inside of the frames uh, array inside of the tile set class. And then the tile set class is going to be using the frame class to define its rectangular regions to cut images out of the tile sheet image. So how we get the frame is we just get the frames array from our games tile set. Then we go ahead and we hand in the player's current frame value, which is kept up to date on every cycle of our game loop. Inside of the update function, we're going to be calling player.updateAnimation, and that's going to update our frame value inside of the loop function, most likely, of our animator class. So draw object is going to take all this information and put it together to give us the appropriate image that we need to see to make our animation work on the screen. So what we're going to do is we're going to hand in our source tile sheet image. Then we're going to hand in the actual source frames X and Y position to cut from. Then this is going to look a little complex, but it's really not. We're going to hand in the player's X location and Y location. And we're just going to add basically an offset where we want the frame to show up and be drawn to the screen. So right now the player's frame is slightly offset from the player's real location. And the reason I want that to happen is so when I stand on the edge of a tile, I actually fall through. And if you look, his ears on the, the frame are actually kind of moving through the tile or if I go over here the, the image itself is actually overlapping the tile I don't want it to be pixel perfect like that I want it to be functional I want the player to have fun I don't care about pixel perfect collision as much as I do the player having fun so this code basically what it does is it just repositions the frame a little bit to center it on the player's position so we can more easily move him around the screen without that a pixel perfect collision that makes his hitbox seem a lot larger than it needs to be. So all this does, it gets his X position, it adds the center, or it gets the center of where I want to draw that frame on top of the player by just getting half of his width, subtracting half of the frame source frames width, and then it just adds the frames offset X position. If I don't add that offset X position, and remember I was talking about that for the frame class, if I come back into the frame class all the way at the bottom here, we define the offset X and offset Y, and then when we actually instantiate each frame, we're going to add negative 2, which is the going offset Y position for this player. If I don't add negative 2, this is what happens. I just set it to 0, I saved, I'm going to come back in here. As you can see now, that was the y offset he's now two pixels deep into the ground and that does not look quite right so that's why i have that offset position all it does is add a slight offset when i draw the frame to the screen to make him appear in the appropriate location so that's it that's all that does you don't need this stuff like i said i i'm using a frame based approach you could easily use a tile based approach where you have all your graphics inside of one big grid kind of like the tiles are instead of having them all close together and cutting them out specifically. The reason I do this is because if I were to add, let's say my, my rabbit has a sword, and the sword comes out to here, now my sprite is going to be different, and it's not necessarily going to fit uniformly into a box or into a grid row and column cell with all the other sprites. So I do it this way because sprites change. They change in size. They vary in size depending on what animation you're doing. So this is just much more flexible for me. So... Now let's get back into the rendering function. Went off on a little rant there. So basically all the draw object function does of the display class is just draw from the tile set from the frames X and Y position and it draws to the screen whatever frame is currently in the animation, in the player's animation, draws that frame to the screen at a slight offset position. Then we call display.render and that draws everything to the screen, including the tiles and whatever frame of animation our player is in. 
All right, so now let me just quickly see if I actually missed anything here. I think I went over everything, how everything works. Let me take a look inside of the player class itself and actually see how we're doing the player's animation, how we're actually deciding which frames to display and which frame sets to use. This is going to be done inside of the update animation function. So update anima animation is going to be called on every cycle of our game loop. And it's basically just going to check to see what direction the player is facing. And it's going to choose an animation based on that. So the very first if statement inside of update animation is going to be, is the player moving up? Which means, is the player jumping up? So if I press up on the keyboard, the player is going to move up. And if you look closely, you can see that the up animation or the up frame is played briefly while he's moving up. While he's moving down, it switches back to uh, idle left. So if he is moving up and if his direction, which is determined just by which direction he's facing. So when I press the left key, his direction is going to be negative one. When I press the right key, direction is going to be positive one. So if his direction is negative one, so if he's facing left, I'm going to change his animation frame set to jump left. If that's not the case and he's facing the right, I'm going to change his animation frame set while he's jumping to jump right. I'm going to do that in the pause position. Now for these other ones, basically, is he moving to the left? If he is and his velocity is a certain amount, then we're going to play the move left animation. If the velocity is not a certain amount or less than that, basically, if he's basically stopped and his velocity is very small, we're going to play idle left instead. Now, this is cool because what this functionality allows us to do is it allows us to have our player gradually stop walking even though we're not pressing the walk key anymore. So if I were to come in here and change this code to, let's say this is the left walking animation. What is this? Move left. Let's change this to 2, negative 2. And I saved. I'm going to come up here, refresh my screen. Now let's see what happens for the walk animation. Because I have to be moving at 2, a velocity of 2 to the left, the move animation doesn't actually run unless I hit that 2 pixels of movement velocity per frame. So what this allows me to do is it allows me to create an effect where I gradually walk to a stop instead of just halting to a stop really hard like that. So a better, a better kind of example would be if I used 1 instead and I refresh the screen up here. Let's see what that looks like. Now I start walking right away because I hit a velocity of one to the left really quick. But as soon as I stop, I go into the idle animation and that's not really good because it looks like I'm sliding too much. Or maybe you do prefer that and that's the great thing about this code. You can just do whatever you want. I kind of like it where I'm just going to gradually stop walking until I'm completely stopped. I don't prefer to just automatically stop and slide on my feet like that. So what I've done is I've just set a very small value for the velocity check and if he is moving slower than negative 0.1 pixels to the left then he's going to idle and if not he's going to continue walking until he just comes to that gradual stop like that so that's pretty cool so basically the update animation function is fired on every frame after you do collision detection with the player in the world and it just determines what way he's moving and depending on what direction he's moving it runs a certain animation now this is actually really important, it's more important than you think, not necessarily for the player, because you can have fine control over the player, but for non-player characters who move on their own, you have to determine their animation based on how they're moving, because you don't control them. You can't say, play the run animation when I press the run key, because you're not pressing a key for a non-player character. For those non-player characters, you have to keep track of what direction they're moving, how they're moving. And based on that, you have to set their animation. So that's what this code does. It just automates the process of setting the animation. It doesn't rely on key presses or user input. It just sets the animation depending on what direction he's moving. And I think that's it. I think that wraps up everything to do with animation for part five. I went over it really, really fast. So if you guys have questions, definitely leave those in the comments.
In this video, I talked a bit about how sprite animation works and how I did the sprite animation for this example program. It's hard to cover everything in just one video, so if you have questions, please ask, and if you have any ideas on how I can improve my content, let me know. This program is reaching the point where it's too big to understand the whole thing if you haven't watched from the beginning, so if you feel a little lost, I suggest going back and watching the first four videos in this series. And of course, be sure to check out the source code on my GitHub page. Anyway, thanks for watching, and I'll see you next time.